picture the scene. It's 1306. You've just been crowned king. You've barely got the throne warm. And you've just been defeated by Edward the Longshanks. To rub a liberal dose of salt into the wound. He's also executed one of your brothers and taken all the women in your family prisoner. Just to stick a cherry on the cake. The Pope has decided to excommunicate you all because you fell out with a rival and got a bit stabby with him in a church. You're in a bit of a quandary. In terms of having a mountain to climb, it's a bit like turning up at Everest, having spent the last five years sitting on the couch playing Grand Theft Auto. Welcome to Scotland Unplugged and the story of Robert the Bruce and that spider. One of the oldest stories going, like a sort of medieval little engine that could, Robert the Bruce is not having a good year. On the run from Longshanks, he holes up in a cave. Probably not this cave, but one equally cave-like. There are many caves that claim to be THE cave. One in Kirkpatrick Fleming near Lockerbie, one on Arran, and at least two on Rathlin Island. He would probably have hidden in multiple caves, being as he was on the run. It hasn't really been the easiest transition to monarchy. Bruce is thought to have been born in Turnberry Castle, now home to a lighthouse designed by Robert Stevenson, father of that Robert Stevenson, and also part of a golf course owned by that Donald and home to what is definitely the most ornate public toilet I've ever seen. There are a few theories about him being born down south, maybe in Dumfrieshire, possibly in Essex, depending on who you have time to listen to. But what we do know is, he was born on the 11th of July, 1274. When Bruce was 18, the aforementioned Longshanks named John Balliol, King of Scotland, assuming he would be some kind of puppet which he kind of was, only Eddie wasn't pulling the strings. But why, I hear you ask? Surely Edward was King of England. Why did he get to make the call? The nobles in Scotland were also determined to be king themselves, but they couldn't decide on the best candidate. So they decided to defer to a higher power, an elder statesman, someone they could trust to make an impartial decision. Longshanks was a formidable commander and a formidable character. Loved King Arthur, loved a crusade, loved Wales so much he'd vacuumed that up already. One account has the Dean of St Paul's all fired up and angry, ready to confront Longshanks over his perceived high taxation, expiring on sight when he met him. To be fair, he does sound like a bit of a keyboard warrior. Robert's father, the imaginatively titled Robert de Bruce, withdrew his own claim to the throne in favour of his 18-year-old son. John Bailey was eventually stripped of his crown after what we could really call a mutiny. The upshot of that mutiny was that Bailey wound up as a sort of piggy in the middle, and then he finished up in the Tower of London. There was a fair bit of back and forth over the years with Robert the Bruce initially being on the side of Longshanks. Then he wasn't. Then he was made Joint Guardian of Scotland along with John Common the Red, who had a legitimate claim to the throne, as well as an eye on all of the Bruce's toys. Then got double-crossed by Common, who himself went over to the side of Longshanks and stole said toys, then met up with Common in Greyfriars Kirk and Dumfries to iron out their differences and have a heart-to-heart. -heart. Then accidentally stabbed Common, and then accidentally asked two of his followers to go back and finish the job, and then got excommunicated. Bit of a faux pas. Six weeks later, on Palm Sunday 1306, in Schoon Palace, Robert the Bruce, Earl of Carrick, Lord of Annandale, was crowned King of Scots. And that pushed him firmly back to the top of Longchance's hit list. He'd already had William Wallace hung, drawn and quartered and sent the various bits of him out to different places in the country. He'd already had a puppet king installed on the throne and made him abdicate. And now he was back to deal with another pesky Scot. It was just inconvenient. 
Longshanks turned up in Scotland with an army, a note from the Pope, and a dose of the rage. As a reward for his followers, he divided up the lands of Bruce and anyone who followed him. Edward gave orders for no mercy to be shown, and for anyone captured to be executed. On the 19th of June, 1306, the two forces met at the Battle of Methven. The opposing force was led by Aymer de Valence. Valence was Bruce's second cousin. He was also John Common's brother-in-law. Awkward. Bruce called out his cousin. Under the tradition of chivalry, Valence was kind of honour bound to come out of the castle he was holed up in and face Bruce on the field of battle. But Edward had suspended all of that. Word came back to Bruce it was a bit late in the day to do battle. Far better to wait till the morning and regroup. The Bruce ordered his men to set up camp six miles away and prepare for the onslaught the following day. Meanwhile, his cousin sent his army to overwhelm Bruce's in the night. Bruce was lucky to escape with his life. Others weren't so lucky in one way or another. In the meantime, Bruce's wife, his daughter, and two of his sisters had been spirited away to Coldrummy Castle to keep them safe. On the 13th of September, an army led by Edward the Prince of Wales captured the castle and took Nigel de Bruce, Robert's brother, prisoner. He was later executed in Berwick. His wife, daughter, and sisters were nowhere to be seen, but they were eventually captured a few days later. No one really knows where Robert the Bruce spent the winter of 1306 and early 1307, as well as the usual theories about Arran and Rathlin Island and everywhere else. Some think that he may have been sheltered in the Outer Hebrides by Christina of the Isles. Also, it's possible he could have been in Norway, as his sister was the Dowager Queen there. Anyway, back in the cave, legend has it, depressed, defeated, dejected, he found himself watching a spider trying to climb a wall. The spider wasn't having much luck, but it didn't give up, and eventually it managed to weave a web. This marks the turning point in the whole story, the point at which our hero turned it all around. If the spider could keep trying, why couldn't he? It's etched into the national consciousness. It's etched into the global consciousness. If at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. It's a good message, a good story. However, there is a slight problem. There is absolutely zero documented evidence of this ever having happened. Well, not contemporary evidence anyway. So in historical terms, it's what they call a load of old Horlicks. In fact, the story is thought to have originally been told about James Douglas, a man so involved in a bromance with the Bruce that when he himself died in battle, fighting in a crusade in Andalusia years after Bruce's death, he was actually carrying the king's heart in a silver box on a chain round his neck. The legend didn't actually wind up on paper until 1828, when it was published by Sir Walter Scott, the man who monetized Scotland. So just the 522 year gap then. Walter Scott had a bit of a reputation for invention. In fact, he liked to reinvent old stories just to keep them alive, preserve them for tradition, and to make copious amounts of money. Artistic license, anyone? The truth is, we have no evidence that the spider thing ever really happened. So, here's a story about something that did. This is Galloway. It's quite easy on the eye. In the summer of 1307, this was the site of the real change in fortunes. This is Glen Trull, and these are the steps of Trull, the perfect place to hide an army. Bruce had come ashore in Turnberry and was about to wage all-out guerrilla warfare. 
His brothers, Thomas and Alexander, came ashore further down the coast in Loch Ryan and were promptly captured and executed. The Bruce was still on the back foot, but not for long. From Glentrill, Bruce executed a raid on English forces camped out here on the shore of Clattering Shaw's Loch. This is Bruce's stone. Local legend has it that after the raid here, he rested against this stone, along with probably several other stones scattered throughout the country. Not a huge success by any means, but crucially, it alerted Valance to Bruce's presence. And after that, it was only natural he'd go hunting. Valance sent his men into Glentrull, but as you can see, there isn't a lot of room between the loch and the hillside. The Bruce used his knowledge of the terrain to full advantage. The Bruce ordered his men to use levers to loosen as many boulders as they possibly could, which they then rolled down the hill, quite literally crushing the opposition. It's reckoned they then followed up with stones, arrows, hand-to-hand -hand combat, anything really to finish the job. It wasn't a big victory, arguably more of a skirmish than a battle, but in propaganda terms, it was massive. It marked a real turning point, a step change and a change in style of fighting that would lead to ultimate victory. The following month, the Bruce won a much more high profile engagement at the Battle of Loudon Hill. And from then on, his fortunes began to change. So. Where does that leave us with the spider? Well, we don't know it happened, but we don't know it didn't. And I, for one, will keep on telling my kids the story. It's a timeless moral classic. Along with all the greats, Pinocchio, the Gruffalo, the Very Hungry Caterpillar. See you next time, when hopefully, I'll get a little bit less wet.